Hi, welcome to uh, Unit 3, the Atom Recording 3. And in this recording, uh, we're going to be talking and discussing the quantum mechanical model of the atom. And in a lot of ways, uh, this work was started by a scientist by the name of Niels Bohr. And if you will remember back to the previous recordings, we said that Bohr was a student of Rutherford's. Uh, Rutherford was the uh, the scientist that came up with the gold foil experiment and in the model the first uh, truly nuclear model of the atom and uh, with Niels Bohr uh, he is credited with what they call the planetary model uh, of the atom with electrons traveling around in orbits around a positively charged nucleus and the story goes that he uh, he was bedridden uh, for a particular period of time with I think it was pneumonia might have been some other uh, ailment but he asked his fiance to come and bring him some reams of paper and pencils and he had a problem that he wanted to think about and attack um, uh, now that he had time uh, that he wasn't so involved in, in creating experiments and, and doing work. And so he came up with this model of the atom. And uh, actually, he borrowed some math uh, from somebody called Re uh, Reisberg. Um, and uh, this equation that he came up with, with calculating the energy of electrons, was actually... Uh, uh, borrowed from another scientist and you know we said Galileo said I've been able to reach such great heights because I've stood on the shoulders of giants and so uh, although um, the the idea uh, came from Bohr and the concept he used some mathematical uh, constants and things that came from other scientists um, so uh, he came up with this planetary model and this model had some assumptions First, there were no in-between energy levels. You were either in uh, one energy level or the other, and there weren't any in-between. So to reach a higher energy level, you had to absorb a frequency of energy high enough to get you up to the next level. For an electron to move up a level, certain specific frequency of energy would have to be absorbed. And they call this a quantum of energy. Uh, and that's where this quantum mechanical model comes from. The Bohr model continued. When electrons uh, fell down energy levels, they emit light in the, ter in, the, uh, in the form of energy. And we call these a quantized emission of energy. And this is kind of a cool diagram that we've got here uh, showing uh, these uh, different energy levels n is equal to one so the energy level that's closest to the nucleus gets a value of one the second one a two the next one a three and so uh, when an electron absorbs energy uh, with enough frequency to go up an energy level uh, and then it falls back down it emits this energy of light uh, or uh, energy of an emission called a quantized emission. The chemical properties of elements uh, are due to the placement of their electrons. And so this is super important. And we'll talk more and more and more about this as uh, the units progress. Uh, where the electrons are in the atom really influences their ability to react with other atoms outside of their own. And so the further the electron gets away from the nucleus, the higher the energy level of that electron. Bohr's work was based on spectrography of the hydrogen atom, and it worked really well uh, for the hydrogen atom, and it was able to predict the energies super well. But it didn't work on heavier elements. Once we had multiple electron systems, uh, the uh, the math kind of failed, and so we needed a better uh, a better model. And uh, the development of that model came from some other scientists. And uh, uh, the wave nature uh, it says to accomplish this task, uh, Bohr model and the work done of the wave nature developed by Planck and De Broglie was used to develop 
this quantum mechanical model. So scientists building on the work of other scientists. Model is based on the probability of finding an electron in certain regions in space around the nucleus. And we'll discuss uh, why this probability concept is so important uh, in the following slides. And Heinsberg came up with what he called the uncertainty principle, saying that you cannot know the position and momentum of a particle at any given period in time. Particles such as electrons are so small, the act of seeing them alters their position. So if you'll recall back to uh, the experiment done by Young in the double split experiment, one of the things that they noticed was that when they uh, tried to detect the electron, uh, it changed the behavior of how the electron moved. Um, when when they turned on an energy source, uh, light is an energy source. We learned that in the electromagnetic spectrum. That light would actually move the electron and create a different pattern of movement. And so when we're looking at the electron, we say don't we don't really actually know exactly where it is because by the, the fact that we try to detect it alters its position. And so we talk more about the probability of finding electrons in certain regions in space uh, than we do uh, having the electron uh, a fixed uh, position. Uh, you can think of it as perhaps one of your, your buddies. Uh, say you have a friend and you want to locate them on a Friday night. Well, chances are your friend may be an avid skateboarder, let's say. So the probability of finding your friend at the skate park on a Friday night is relatively high, maybe 80%. But it, that does not take into account that his family may have a birthday celebration or he may have decided to go to a movie with another friend or something like that. So the, this friend is highly energetic, just like the electron. And uh, you may or may not find him in the region in space or the position that you might expect him to be in. Schrodinger's equation was able to quantify the probability of finding electrons using wave functions. And uh, so he was able to do the mathematical calculations of, of, uh, of finding electrons or working out the probability of finding electrons in regions in space. Quantum addresses of electrons. Okay, so uh, Schrodinger and Heinsberg and other scientists uh, were able to work out some uh, 3D um, picture of the atom based on probability. And they use what we call quantum numbers to do so. And there are four basic quantum numbers. The first one is called the principal quantum number. Notice here, how it is actually it's misspelled on my slide uh, embarrassing uh, it should be p-r-i-n-c-i-p-a-l i think i copied this from someplace and they they misspelled it it should be p-a-l because it is the main quantum number it's not an idea uh, of course it's an idea and a principle but it's the main quantum number just like the principal is the main educator in the building so this is the main uh, quantum number, and that should be read P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L, quantum number. It tells the energy level and the size of the electron cloud. L is the second quantum number. It's called the Zumpfel quantum number, or the angular momentum quantum number. It tells the sub-energy level and the shape of the electron cloud. In the next slide, we'll talk more about how these relate to each other. Uh, but they, you can think of them as a street address for an electron. You might have the first part being the, the street name and the second part being the street number. M is the magnetic quantum number. tells the number of orientations in space of each sub-energy level. And then you have the spin quantum number telling the direction of the electron spin, clockwise or counterclockwise. So I might take a few minutes to pause the video and to write these down. Uh, you'll need to become very familiar with each one of these quantum numbers and what they mean. And then a little later on, 
uh, we'll relate this to uh, to position on the periodic table and energy levels and reactivity and all sorts of of uh, of concepts relating to different elements. Now, so now we are going to write a quantum number chart down, and we will refer to this to give uh, electron addresses to specific elements, um, ele uh, electrons within elements, and it's really super cool. So the first quantum number we're going to talk about is n, which we will call the principal quantum number. Principal, right? The main one. And this one talks about the size of the cloud and the energy level of the electron. And with these, num with these uh, quantum numbers, a lot of times we have letters and numbers. And with the, quant the principal quantum number, we'll just do uh, numbers. We'll say one, two, three, and four here. So we'll talk about these energy levels. And as, as you go down the chart uh, from energy level one, two, three, and four, you get more and more energy. So the energy here increases as you go down the chart. So the next level is called the L which is the azumphal, A-Z-U-M-T-H-A-L, azumphal quantum number. In some texts and some notations, they call it the angular momentum quantum number. And this is the shape of the cloud and the sub-energy level. And these have letters and, uh, and numbers. So we say S, S-P, S-P, D, S, P, D, and F. And these have numbers associated with them also, and we'll talk more about writing quantum numbers later. And so they have S, we say is zero, P is one, D is two, and F is three. Zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so you can kind of notice a pattern here. Uh, the first quantum number has one subshell. The second quantum number has two subshells. The third quantum number has three subshells. And the fourth has four sub-energy levels. Subshells are sub-energy levels. So we have uh, L or N, L, and then we have M, which is magnetic. I'm going to back up here just for a second and talk about the the concept of shape of cloud. Okay, so with and and we'll see in the following slides we'll see the different shapes and and a little bit better drawings. But I'll try to give you a a general uh, feeling for the uh, shapes of the electron clouds here. So an S looks like a sphere. So this would be an S cloud. A P kind of looks like a dumbbell. And P has three different orientations in space. And we'll talk about that in the next quantum number. But the P can be a PX, a PY, or a PZ. <laughs> I like that. Okay. X, P, Y, P, Z. The D's are a little bit more difficult to draw, so I'm going to let you see those in the following slides. But this is to give you an idea of what we mean by shape of a cloud. So the electrons will be traveling around in a cloud. So an S cloud can have two electrons, and a P a cloud can have a grand total of six electrons, so two electrons per orientation. So that's what the next quantum number talks about. The magnetic quantum number tells about the number of orientations, orientations in space, okay? And with these, uh, these have uh, numbers and letters as well, but we generally just draw orbitals or little circles to denote the orientations in space. So this is an or orbital, and in each orbital you can have two electrons. 
try to draw this one a little bit bigger. So notice here, with the P orientation in space, you have, or the P subshell, you have three orientations in space. So the S can just have one. No matter how you make an S, it still looks like a sphere, right? But the P can have different orientations in space and can be more three-dimensional. A D actually has five different orientations in space. I didn't draw that one because it's a little bit harder to draw. And then an F has seven. Looks like a bunch of bowling balls, doesn't it? Or cannonballs. And so with this, I'll try to separate these out best I can. And so each one of these little circles can have two electrons. So you have one orbital. So we'll put number of orbitals, one, three, one, three, five, one, three, five, and seven. Okay. So you can place two electrons per orbital. And that's the last quantum number is spin. And so within these orbitals, one electron will be spinning one way and the other electron will be spinning in the opposite direction. And we call that the spin quantum number. And it'll be plus one half for up and minus one half for a down spin. We just put arrows up or down within those orbitals. So now we're going to put maximum electrons and we're going to put per subshell first and maximum electrons per shell. So with an S, you can just have two electrons, one spinning up, one spinning down. And for this whole energy level, for the whole first energy level, you can have a maximum of two electrons. So two for an S and for a P, you can have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So <clears throat> here you can have a maximum of six electrons. For an S2, for a P6, five times two would give you how many? 10, <laughs> okay, two, six, 10, and seven times two would give you 14. All right, so now let's calculate up the number of total electrons per shell. These are called the shell, and these sometimes are called the subshell, shell and subshells. So here, two plus six would give us eight. Two, six, and eight makes 18. Two, six, 10, and 14 makes 32. And so this is the quantum number chart for an uh, to use to do electron configurations and we start using this and then we can switch over to using the periodic table to do electron configurations or to write out uh, a quantum number uh, for an electron. Okay, so I will, I think you should probably pause <laughs> and write this down. I'll try to put a uh, in the materials, I'll try to put a finished quantum number chart for you to look at since this is a little bit hard to, to see and follow along with. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it might be a good idea to take that pre-made one and then look at the video again to kind of get a feel for it. Okay, uh, some orientations. Here we have an S and a P. I'll show those to you on the previous slide. I kind of drew those out. This P here, you can have multiple different P orbitals. You can have one going in this direction, one going up and down, and then one going in this direction. And so you have uh, a p orbital with three different orientations in space or magnetic quantum numbers. You can look at it that way as well. D and F orbitals, you can see how complex those get. With a uh, D orbital, you can be in between the axial planes and that kind of thing. All sorts of different kinds of, excuse me, orientations for the F orbital. And now uh, we're going to talk about how to use these writing electron configurations. 
you can follow along with the quantum number chart. In fact, I might put a little quantum number chart up here, a rough one, and show how both of these work. So let's see if I can do that. So let's write a electron configuration using the quantum number chart and then using the uh, periodic table. So I would encourage you to print off a periodic table and label it like I have with the S here. The Actually, this should be a P here. I need to mark that out and put a P in the D here and F down here. So you see F. So number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And notice here that the D block elements are offset three and so forth. And I'll show you why that is here in a minute as well. So let's write the electron configuration for hydrogen. Hydrogen just has one electron. We write for hydrogen one s so one s and one electron and so that is the electron configuration for hydrogen we also do a orbital notation draw a circle and a little arrow going up and so it's too tough to try to write the actual orientations in space like this so we just for each orientation we draw a circle so for a p orbital, we will draw three circles when we get to one with a p orbital. Okay. So also, I forgot to say, you need to take your helium here and put it over here next to your hydrogen just for electron configurations. Okay. So we'll put a helium there. So helium is our next one. That's two electrons. So we say one s and then two, one S2. Helium has two electrons and we do a circle and two arrows. Notice here how we could have used, instead of this quantum number chart, we could have used a periodic table. We could have said one S and then counted over one, two spaces, one S2. Okay. So let's do a couple more using this. I'm going to erase some of the uh, notations here just so that we'll have a little more room to write. You can follow along with the quantum number chart that you have as well in your notes. So let's do that. Okay, so now we've got uh, hydrogen and helium. The third element would be lithium with three electrons, one S2 one, one, S, two. And then we've taken care of this first row. So we're going to write our electron configurations just like we're writing, a, reading a book. We'll write, read from left to right. And then we come down here to the second line and two S. And then we stop on the element that we're going for, two S, one. So that would be two S, one. Okay, all right, so our orbital notation would look like this. I always draw the first one clockwise and the next one counterclockwise, so 1s2. So now, I think we can skip over beryllium because it would just be 2s2, right? And let's do nitrogen. So nitrogen has uh, seven electrons. So 1s2, remember we're going to fill them like we're reading a book. Remember off-ball principle says they fill from low energy level to high. So we'll, we'll come over here. 1s2, then 2s2, and then we're going to number these here in the middle, just like the ones over here on the side. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this would be 2 Remember, we change that to a P, 2P3. Okay, so let's write those down. So 1S2, 2S2, 2P3. All right, so let's count and make sure that we have the right number of electrons. We've got 2 plus 2 is 4, and 3 makes 7, so we've got 7 electrons. So let's do our orbital notation. 1, orbital, 4 and S, 1 orientation in space, 
A P has three orientations in space, remember? Three orientations in space. And so we fill the electrons singly until they have to pair within each subshell. And so these electrons will fill singly because it takes less energy to do so. So you'll have one electron in each orbital. So there's nitrogen. So let's do another uh, one or two here. And then we'll do some more on the uh, other uh, page. Uh, maybe we'll erase some of these up here and do a longer one. This should follow along with the quantum number chart from top to bottom so far. Uh, and it works pretty well until you get down to the fourth energy level. And we'll do one of those here in a minute as well. So let's uh, pick up another one here. Let's do a longer one, argon. So argon is atomic number 18. 1s2, 1s2. Two, okay, two s two, and then two p one two three four five six two p six. I'm going to go ahead and label these for y'all. So two p, and there's six spaces there. So two p six, and then we're down here to three s two. And then 3, P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so there we go. That is argon. So let's do the orbitals for each one now. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Remember, 3 has 3, or P has 3 orientations in space. And we'll just X these out because they are all the way full as a full outer shell. So there we go. So that's how you would do the uh, electron configuration in orbital notation to this point. And now we are going to take a deviation off of the quantum number chart and just use our uh, periodic table to do our configurations. Okay, so now let's do a few more and do some down the chart. Uh, with a little bit higher uh, quantum numbers uh, involved. Let's do vanadium, for example, here. Vanadium has a quantum number, atomic number of 23. So uh, we will start at the top of the chart and say 1s2. All right, look at your chart. In fact, I can draw a little cheat chart up here to help us with it. And then we'll drop down here and go 2s2 and then 2p6 then 3s2 and then 3p6 so we're down here right and then after the third one then you get into the fourth one which would be the d block okay so on your periodic table we come over here and it says 4s2 and then 3d and on the 3d we're counting over to vanadium and it's about right there and it's one two three spaces over so one two three spaces over so we'll have three spaces there so if you read your periodic table from top to bottom from left to right uh, when you end up at vanadium you should end up with the 3D notation. So let's draw our orbitals here for that. Now a D, if you count in that D block, you should count over 10 spaces. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So starting with SC or scantium and then counting all the way over to Z and zinc, there's 10 spaces there. But we stopped at vanadium uh, because that's the electron configuration that we're going for here. So vanadium would have a 3D3 orientation. And since you have the possibility of having five different orientations, one, two, three, four, five, you have a possibility of having 10 total electrons. And so you show the blank orbitals when you're doing your orbital notation. 
and as before we fill them singly until they have to pair cross these out since they're all the way full just make it a little faster to do it 3d 10 okay let's do another one as well let's do uh maybe we will do uh selenium se selenium has 34. okay so i'm going to show you a trick to be able to do this a little bit faster and it's called the short form orientation okay so if you write a short form electron configuration you can uh, use what they call the noble gas core as your starting place so with that the noble gases are in group 18 so they're the ones over at the far end of the periodic table right here so for selenium you know that the electrons are full all the way down above selenium to the noble gas that's directly above selenium which is argon so if you look on the periodic table you have selenium right here in the p block it's atomic number 34 and the element above selenium is sulfur so you would go over chlorine and then you'd look at argon and argon would be the first notation in your short form electron configuration so what you would do is you would draw brackets like this and you go a r 18 and then you would start your electron configuration on atomic 19 all the way down to 34 which is selenium so our electron configuration there would be a 4s2 if you stop there it would be calcium then 3d10 and that would take you all the way through zinc and then 4e and then you count over to selenium which is one two three four four p four here it would be selenium and you would fill the last electrons here we'll cross these out since they're all the way full so now with our 4p4 we will fill them singly and then we will pair like that